All right, so we're starting Perek Revi'im Pirkei Avot, fourth chapter. We're getting closer to the end. Mishnah Aleph Ben Zoma, Omer Ben Zoma, tells us, Eizu Chacham. You want to know who is a wise person? It's not necessarily one who's knowledgeable, who knows a lot. The test to know if one is a true Chacham, what the rabbis, what the Torah would consider the Chacham, a wise man, is Halomed Mikol Adam, one who is prepared to continue to learn. And not only to continue to learn, to aspire to always know more and more, but to be prepared to learn from just anyone that can teach him. He's not afraid, he's not ashamed of learning from those who are younger than him, those who know less than him, because he's focused on acquiring knowledge. What difference does it make where that knowledge comes from? Very important idea here. A true Chacham always learns. He never stops learning. Learning is important to him. And he demonstrates that by pursuing it. Shenemar, as the Pasuk says, Mikol Melameda Hiskalti. I was able to learn something from all my teachers. Even one letter, one Pasuk, one Halakha. As the Rabbis tell us, one is supposed to be Mechabed, to respect those who have taught him even something small, a small detail. What's the significance of this uh, chokhmah, of this chacham? <coughs> Obviously, it is important to be knowledgeable, it is important to learn Torah, it is a mitzvah to learn. But here we're, we're trying to define the, the proper definition for it, what is chacham. We're trying to figure out wh what is praiseworthy, what is something to, be, to admire about a Chacham. So he makes a point, it's not the amount of knowledge, the vast amount of knowledge that the person has. That's not necessarily something to admire. The true admiration, even though that's also admirable, but the true admiration goes to someone who values the Chochmah so much that he's willing to continue at any cost, to go to great lengths, to go to shoot him even though they're far from his home. Because he wants to learn more and more, he never wants to stop learning. As the rabbis tell us, that is why Talmid Chacham is called Talmid Chacham, the student of a Chacham, because he's always a student. He always considers himself a student. One never stops learning. Life is full of learning experiences. The more so for a Jew, there's always what to learn, even though you've covered it once, when anytime we review the Chumash, the Halakha, there's always something to gain more, more insight, better understanding, more clarity. But more than that, it's the attitude that one has towards the Chucham that really matters over here. Because that really is more indicative than anything else, that this is a real Chacham. The reason why a real Chacham is prepared to learn from anyone, even from those who are younger than him, is because his learning experience is always the Shem Shamayim. It's not in order to to be respected by others that he's learning. He's learning for the sake of learning. And since his learning is for the sake of learning, as we say, the Shem Shamayim, that helps him uh, deal with any situation that arises. In other words, it's a youngster, it's a child that I'm going to learn from. That's the only possibility. I'm not going to be embarrassed about it. In other words, if, if he has something really uh, to offer, why not? Because it's the Shem Shamayim. The Shem Shamayim means that, that you are willing to do anything to acquire the Chokhmah. And of course, a Chacham, a true Chacham also is aware that Chokhmah is something that can be picked up from many, from many places, from many people. It is not limited to just a couple of individuals. There is a funny story, with Rabbi Le I think it was Rabbi Levi Yitzhak Mibardichev. He was once uh, in a town collecting funds for a very important cause. And he had a very difficult time collecting funds. People were not helping him out. Anyway, the, on the last day of his trip, he decides, you know what? Uh, I already tried my best. I might as well head home. I have better things to do, at least with my time. You know, if I can't succeed here, I might as well go home. Anyone anyway, on his last day, he's about to go home. He's approached by a few people in town. Please, before you go, 
go and, and pay a visit to the jail. Is what's in jail? He says there is a, a Jew who, who was a thief, you know, and as a result of uh, him being caught this last time, he landed in jail. <laughs> so maybe you can give him a little bit of musar and you know, give it to him, as we say, you know, let him know that he should be careful and he shouldn't behave like that. Like that. It's a chilul Hashem. It's, it's, it's wrong. But you can give him a speech. So the rabbi goes to the jail and begins to give a speech to the ganav, to the thief. You see, crime doesn't pay. <laughs> You're caught, it's wrong, get your act together, begin to live a normal life, a decent life, or get married, you know, whatever, have a family. He gives him a whole speech. It doesn't pay. You see, you got caught. It never pays. Anyway, after the rabbi is done, the ganav tells the rabbi, Rabbi, you have it all wrong. You see, I was caught this time. I'm going to try again. Next time they won't catch me. I'm not going to give up. This time they caught me. Hopefully next time they won't. <laughs> so the rabbi stopped for a moment and he says, Wow, I just learned something from a thief. <laughs> if you don't succeed today, try hard again. You know, it's something. there's a saying like that in English, right? If you don't succeed the first time around, try again. Don't give up. Look at this thief. He was caught. He's in jail. And he's willing to try harder next time. So he shouldn't be caught. If he can do that, you know, for sure I can do that. He stayed in town. <laughs> and he went ahead and tried his luck again. So yeah, you can learn from, even from a thief. However, in order for one to, to learn, to be prepared to learn, one has to have a very important condition. Without this condition, it will make it difficult for him. And that is the, the willingness to accept criticism. Because part of learning, part of understanding, part of being able to, to have more clarity is being able or, or being willing, I should say, to accept people's observations Right? people's analysis, people's criticism of what we do. Otherwise, if that we leave out, that we don't want to know, that we don't want to hear, then that's not learning. Learning means you're willing to learn even if it involves criticism, even if it involves somebody pointing out mistakes. That's also learning. So a very important condition to continue to learn, to really learn, is the willingness to accept criticism. It is understood here, it is also inferred, and we have a tradition in the Gemara that one who really does his best makes a big effort to learn. He will receive Siyat Maya, he will receive divine assistance. This is something spiritual nature, this is a mitzvah. One who prays for things that are spiritual nature has a better chance of receiving a positive answer. He's not asking for a new car, he's not asking for luxuries for material uh, things. He's asking to learn. He's asking for Hashem's help in performing a mitzvah, performing a good deed. In that, they do help. So it's important that, of course, one does his best to demonstrate that he really wants this, and then he will receive divine assistance. Not everybody is so strong-minded or really sincere, even though he says he wants to. So the Chafetz Chaim used to give a beautiful mashal for those who say they want to learn, but they don't really live up to it. It says there was once a, a businessman who was not doing too well. He came to town and, and uh, he wanted to, to get a loan. Perhaps a loan would help him get back on his feet. So he was advised to go to the, one of the wealthy men in town, that he will give him a loan, a very nice, generous man that gives people loans. So he went to him. And he starts telling him, my situation is really bad. I really need desperately, I need some help. You know, I need, you know, so much money. Perhaps you can give, give me a loan, you know. No problem paying it back to you. And uh, the rich man says, no problem. I'll help you out. See me tomorrow in my office at 3 o'clock in the afternoon. All right. Tomorrow comes, and this guy never goes to the meeting. All right. It happens. You couldn't make it. Uh, the bus was late, he didn't have a car, 
or whatever. So he sees him in Mincha again. He sees him, the rich man at Mincha, in the Bet Knesset, and he starts telling him the whole story again. You know, I'm in a desperate situation. I'm not doing well. I need your help. Please help me out. He says, well, where were you today? I was waiting for you. I couldn't make it. Okay, come tomorrow. Uh, when would you like tomorrow? Uh, t 12 noon. See you 12 noon. Comes tomorrow, 12 noon, and he's not there. He sees him again in the Bet Midrash. Where were you? I was waiting for you. At, this is the second time. So if something came up, you know, I, 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 I was very busy and I could just, I forgot or whatever. Some excuse. Okay. So come tomorrow again. Right? Tomorrow, please be here. Don't waste my time. All right. Tomorrow. Same time, same place. Comes tomorrow. He doesn't come. The next time they meet up in Minha, in the Beta Knesset, he goes over to him and spills the story again. I'm desperate, I'm having a hard time, please help me out. And the rich man tells him, scram, <laughs> something like that. Get out of here, I don't want to see you, don't bother me, I gave you a chance three times. If you really wanted the money, if you really needed the money, you would have been here the first time. You didn't come three times, you're obviously not so desperate, don't sell me this kind of stories. So the Chafetz Chaim says, every day in the prayer, we ask the Kadosh Baruch Hu before Kriyat Shema, V'tem belibenu bina, le'avin, le'askil, il'mod, le'amed, l'shmor, l'asod, l'kayem. We ask Hashem, please give us the understanding, give us the clarity to be able to understand, to learn the Torah, to teach it. Help us. Every day we ask for the same thing. So the Chafetz Chaim says, but what happens at the end? Do we go to the Beta Midrash? Do we go to a Shi'ur? Hashem says, I'm willing to give you. Come to the Shi'ur, come learn, and you will see that with time, I will help you. I will help you understand it. I will help you motivate you even more. But you have to make the first, uh, you have to make the effort to take the first step. So we make the same requests of the rich man. We make the same requests of Hashem every day, but we don't keep up with it. In other words, we don't follow through with, uh, with, our, with our request. That means we're not sincere, Chaz Shalom. person who was really sincere he asks, okay, he comes. Hashem says, I'm willing to give you. I am willing to give. Him. Hashem says, I'm willing to help everyone. And this, by the way, applies to everything in life. You know, where hishtadlut, where some effort is required, whether it's with shiduchim, whether it's with parnasah. To some degree, to some degree, it requires some hishtadlut. Some effort has to be made. The more bitachon that one has, the more that the person really has faith in God completely, then he needs less yishtadlut. You know, as the Ramban says, if somebody had complete bitachon Bashem 100% and he was sick, he would never have to go to a doctor. Hashem would cure him, would heal him. He wouldn't have to make the effort of even walking to the, of going to the hospital. But we're not on that level. We have to make some effort. The more so when it comes to mitzvot, mitzvot, we, we have to make the entire effort. Even so, Hashem helps. But we have to make the effort. Hashem can't do it for us. You really want it, then prove it. Also, when it comes to learning, uh, an, an idea that a lot of people are unaware of is that the rabbis tell us, oh, havruta, oh, mituta. the proper way to learn Torah is not by oneself, at home with books. Even though we can pick up some information from that, we can definitely review some of our learning from the past like that. But when it comes to really understanding and really learning, uh, where it's especially Gemara and Halakha, where it can become complicated and deep, it is important that one, it be done with Havrutot, with another individual, or with a group of people, or in the Shi'ur. So there's the possibility of asking questions, of, of talking back and forth to each other and saying, no, you're wrong, oh, this is, oh, I didn't realize, yes, but oh, this is like that. There's so much more action going on, and therefore all that action and all that effort and that intensity leads to a better and deeper understanding of whatever it is that is being learned. Especially when you learn things that are deep, Kabbalah, Bechlal, that's abstract. But what if we make a mistake? Who's going to point it out if we are by ourselves at home? So even though learning on, by oneself sometimes is okay, it's acceptable there's nobody there, you're on vacation, you're away from your routine, that's fine. You can review things, you can read things that are, are not as deep or complicated, but generally speaking, learning 
one wants to accomplish a lot in learning, not just to cover ground, but to have a real understanding of what he's learning, it is better served by learning in a group, by learning with at least one chavruta. Chavruta means a, a learning partner. So that was Chacham. Now let's go to the next one that Ben Zoma admires, and admi that's some, something to admire. Ezu Gibor, Hakoveshet Yitzro. Who is a strong man? Who's, who should we admire as being strong? Not one who can lift 500 pounds in the Olympics. Weights, muscles, no. That's not the gvura, that's not the strength we're talking about. The strength that is admirable is Akoveshet Yitzro. One who's able to control his, himself, control his anger, discipline himself. One who's able to overcome his weaknesses, that's called Kovesh et Yitzro Shenemar Tov Erech Apay Migibor Moshel Beruchom Melochedir. He quotes the Pasuk in Mishlei that it is better, more admirable, one who is, controls his anger, he's tolerant of people's mistakes, he doesn't get upset. That's more admirable than somebody who conquers a city. Erech Apay Moshel Beruchom, these are admirable traits. Much more than Oked'ir. What's the point over here? The point over here is that there are different kinds of Gvurot. There are different kinds of strengths in the world. Here he's not talking about physical strength at all. No examples here are given of physical strength because physical strength belongs in the world of animals. That's physical. The stronger animal will dominate. Amongst human beings, that strength is not something that we reckon with so much. That's animalistic. What do we reckon with? What is admirable? What, do we, what should we look up to? What is really strength in human terms? There's two kinds. One, courage at the battlefield. And the other, self-restraint. These two have to do with the heart. Strength of the heart is human. St animal strength is not for the human. I mean, of course, we want to be strong so we can move things around, but that's not how you measure strength. We measure true strength and we admire, we look up to a strong human being when he demonstrates courage or self-restraint. However, between those two, self-restraint and courage, which one is the most admirable? Self-restraint. So that's why he calls the two in the Pasuk. Tov erech apayim migibor umoshel beruchom eloched ir. Strong courage at the battlefield conquering a city. Yeah, but this one is better. Why is this one more admirable? Because to self, to, for one to have self-restraint, it requires good judgment. It requires special skills. Much more than courage in the battlefield. But, one is courageous, he's not afraid, fearless. This one requires a lot more. It's not m more difficult. So that's why this one is much more admirable. And obviously it's more important too. Now here it says, Koveshet Yitzro, not Koveshet HaYetzer. So the commentaries explain here, why does it say Kovesh et Yitzro, his own Yetzer? Because every one of us has a unique, customizable Yetzer to him. One may not be able to be Kovesh that man's Yetzer, but his own he can. That's a very important point, because the rabbis tell us, Ena kadosh baruch hu ba betrunya in biryotav. Hashem will not demand of one, or expect of one, to be able to do more than he can. Hashem therefore never overloads one, never gives one too much of a yoke, of a burden that he cannot handle. It, it, wouldn't, be far, it wouldn't be fair. Whatever one is going through, experience in life, a difficulty of sorts, whatever it may be, that difficulty, whether it's an illness or whatever, he can handle it. Those, of course, who don't want to handle it may have committed suicide. Not because they can't, because they didn't want to. Of course it was difficult. Nobody ever said it was easy. But had they chosen to live, had they understood properly the, the value of, of the gift of life, 
they would not have run away <coughs> because it is foolish to think that the grave is a place to escape to. Things only get worse there. So some people, of course, do not have the right understanding. And, you know, of course, we're not here to criticize them. You know, they obviously were, were very weak. But it does not mean that they did not have the ability to control themselves, to, to overcome their, their yetzer. Because it's talking about their yetzer, Hashem does give the, everyone the strength and the ability to overcome their yetzer. And everyone has some yetzer, some challenges in life that he has to deal with. That is part of his test of his nisyonot in life. Now, the reason why this is admirable is because we said that it's not easy. Not only is it because it's important, it's definitely something important that we do as part of life. But it's not easy. Now, why isn't the Yetzer around something easy? Other than the fact that Hashem did not make it easy, obviously. The reason why in true life, Yetzer is not easy to conquer, and we sometimes win and we sometimes lose in fighting him, is because the Yetzer is a different kind of foe, different kind of enemy than your ordinary enemy. Your ordinary enemy, you beat him once, he leaves you alone. He figures, you know, that's it. And he, and he maybe he's even destroyed. The Yetzer you can't destroy. You won today, guess what? He's there tomorrow again, same time, working overtime. So the Yetzer is a challenge that we have on a daily basis until the day we leave this world. And this Yetzer Ara, even if we defeat him once, twice, three times, he's always going to come back to us. The rabbis, I think, tell us in the Midrash, Yetzer Domele Zvuv. He's compared to a fly. You do this, it comes back. Especially the flies in Israel, for some reason. And the cats, you know. They have this good spy. You throw a rock at them, get lost, and they come. They don't move. They're not faced by it. <laughs> you know. So the, so the rabbis tell us the Yetzirah is like a fly. You do this, it's going to come right back. So it's coming back, so don't think it's gone. Now, even if, you, even if we win today, the danger lies not in, the only, not in only in the fact that he comes back tomorrow. That's besides the point. The one tomorrow may not look at all like the one today. I beat him, I showed him. He can, he could, you see, I, Baruch Hashem, I held myself back from whatever it was. Who says you can hold yourself back tomorrow? Today they offered you a hundred dollars bribe. I resisted. <laughs> tomorrow they're going to offer twenty-five thousand dollars bribe. Can you resist that one too? You see what I mean? So the Yetzara is otagi veret b'shinuya deret. They say in Hebrew, it's the same woman wearing a different dress. <laughs> oh. It's different. No. It's, I mean, it's the same. No, it's not the same. It's, it, it's completely different. And because it's different, you, you don't expect it. We may not be able to handle it. We were in a better mood yesterday. The circumstances were different. So one should never get, be so overconfident that because he was able to deal with this yesterday, today, he didn't get upset. Oh, Hashem, I kept my mouth shut. I behaved myself. Who says tomorrow you can do that too? Tomorrow they're going to come from, you know, from a different angle. They're going to say a different word that's going to really get you upset. Yeah. Yeah, there, there are words in Farsi to insult people, no? If you want to insult or offend, even the Farsi has those words. Yeah? <laughs> Every language does. Yeah, I'm just joking, right? Some of our languages, however, are richer <laughs> than others. <laughs> They have so many kind of words, so many kinds of expressions. And all it takes is <laughs> the wrong one uh, to, to get you upset. I'm not going to mention any. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So that's what it means. The Yetzirah is going to be different. And who says we can beat him the next day? So we have to be on the lookout. There is an interesting... There is an interesting, uh, that's the way though. There's an interesting Ma'amar uh, Chazal, I think it's in Avot Rabbi Natan, which is similar to Pirkei Avot, that says, Eizu gibor shebe giborim. We just talked about the strong individual who's strong because he controls himself. 
You want to know who's stronger than him? You want to know who's the strongest of all? Whoever can make from an enemy his friend. That's, that takes tremendous skill. That takes tremendous courage. That, uh, of course, is not easy at all. Who has the desire, the interest to do that? But sometimes, of course, that is the correct thing to try, to attempt to do, whether it's in a, in a husband-wife relationship. Imagine one taking the initiative and trying to get everything, you know, redone and convincing the other side that, you know, you know, we're not enemies, we're friends, and we're, you know, whatever it is, whatever relationship we're talking about. It, it is possible, but it's, it, take, it requires a tremendous amount of work to accomplish, and that is a real, if whoever does it, that's a really gibosh of But anyway, here we're, we're talking more about self-restraint. All right, before we go on to the next one, there's also a little bit of an emphasis on the tense. It says a kovesh so a kovesh in the present tense, not in the past tense. In other words, he's actively doing it on a constant basis. A kovesh et yitzro, all the time. What is it telling us? That this is something that we have to deal with on a regular basis. This is not something you've done, and that's it, it's gone. A kovesh et yitzro at all times. And this is not only because that's the right way to do it, it's a, it's a fact. That every day we need to deal with it, sometimes more than others. So one always has to be in that, with that kind of a mindset. I'm here to fight. There's no retirement from this fight. I have to be on the lookout. I need to always be careful. That is how we are able to always be on the offensive and, and win. One who sits back and says, okay, it's okay now, it's, the coast is clear. No, that's not a good attitude. It's Kovesh so doing it all the time. We need to fight all the time. What can we do? Especially if you live in a city, a big city, where one has exposure to all kinds of things, we always have to be strict with ourselves, careful, you know, because it's, it's a real war out there in the street. As far as actually <coughs> conquering the Yetzer completely, is that possible? The, rabbi, uh, the rabbis say no. Not only is this a constant war, the Gaon of Vilna explains that we will never succeed in eradicating one bad midah from ourselves, a bad characteristic, because it's part of our nature. We were born with it. To eradicate it? No. A person who's born stingy will always have that quality in him. What do you mean born stingy? Born stingy means he's born with a tendency to be very economical. <laughs> And obviously, he takes it to the extreme. He has that tendency. And of course, he has to work on himself. He has to learn the importance of helping others, to being kind. He has a big job. The stinginess is one of those weaknesses, Shashem Yishmor. It's not easy. But it, you, one can overcome it. So the Gaon of the Gras says, you cannot eradicate that mitah. What can you do? You can control yourself. You can train yourself to do things that you're not doing it by nature. You can stop yourself from doing things that you would otherwise do because of your nature. So we can train ourselves. We can get into the habit of doing certain things or not doing other things. And habits are, uh, formed are like second nature. So we cannot eradicate a, an instinct or a, a midah that is there from birth, but we can control it. So when one gives tzedakah all the time, because he realizes the importance of it, it's a, besides being a mitzvah, he, he gets himself trained and used to it. Is that his nature? No. Does he do it gladly with all his heart? Probably no. <laughs> right? He's doing it because he was told how important it is, and he's trying to get used to it as best as possible. But don't think it comes easy. Don't, I mean, for sure it does not come automatic to him. And this could be said about uh, laziness, and this could be said about anger. There's all kinds of midot. Some people are more prone to this, some people are more prone to that. And the main idea is we have to control ourselves, train ourselves. Rabbi Salanta says, and don't think the training is easy. 
because he says it's easier to learn the entire Shas, all the Gemara. That takes about seven and a half years to finish if you learn one daf a day. It's easier to accomplish that than to change one midah. To change meaning to really control yourself in one midah. To, to succeed in refining one characteristic is much more difficult than to learn the whole shas. So it's not easy. Nevertheless, we can do it. <laughs> All right. Next. Ezo Ashir, who is a wealthy man? Okay, we're done with the strong man, we're done with uh, the Chacham, now we're going on to the Ashir. We're talking about individuals that, are, that, are, that we admire. It's not the one who has a million dollars and not a billion dollars. Ezo Ashir, you know who is a true Ashir? Hasameach Bechilko. One who's content, happy with his lot. Whatever Hashem gave him. He says, Baruch Hashem, I'm happy for that. Sheneemar yigia kapecha kituchel ha-shecha v'tov lach. Pesuk in Tehilim that says, that is, praise be the individual who earns a living through his own hands. He has a good in this world, he has a good in the world to come. So what is this, what is this all about here? A man who's content. Contentment means what? Contentment means satisfied, full. I have. I have what I need. I have what Hashem gave me. The moment a person is content, the word contentment gives an individual a certain feeling of calmness and happiness. That's called ashir. Ashir means I have everything I ever need. I'm, I have. But the millionaire has. No, the millionaire doesn't have. He doesn't have as much as you. Why? Because he wants more. If he wants more, that means he doesn't have something. He's always craving for more and more. So who has more? The one who has less. But he's happy. Who's content with what he has. This is a simple understanding here. Simple but true. That one who's content with a simple lifestyle is happy. He has everything. He's happier than the one who has millions of dollars because that, millions of, the, that individual who has millions of dollars wants more is always worried about how to make more. He doesn't have peace of mind. He's always trying to figure out ways to earn more. And on top of that, because he's always trying to make more money, he doesn't really have that much free time to learn, to spend with his family. The one who's content says, that's it, I worked 9 to 5. He has more time, more time to use for his family, more time to learn, to do mitzvot. What a difference in life between the two of them. Rich involving uh, lots of money is not a guarantee for happiness. Even though there are some people, of course, who are happy, who are wealthy, but it's not a guarantee. Especially the one that we learned in Kohelet, for those of you who remember, we learned Kohelet, there was one individual that Kohelet, Shalomo Melech says, there's one individual that Hashem has given a lot of money, but does not give him the opportunity to enjoy it. Oh, that's terrible. Imagine, there's one type of wealthy individual that Hashem has given him lots of money, but did not give him the opportunity to enjoy all that money. What a shame. However, one who did receive lots of money from Hashem, he should definitely do his best to enjoy it. Besides, of course, giving tzedakah, why should he enjoy it? Why should, why should he allow himself more than the average person? Why not just live very, very modestly? No, Hashem gave you the blessing for some reason. You're entitled to live better, to have a bigger house, a nicer car, more servants. Eat better. Why? You will understand from the following story. There was once a rabbi that came to visit a rich man, very wealthy individual. I guess he came to him for a donation or something. And he came to him while he was eating dinner. What was he eating for dinner? Steak. No. Black bread. You know what black bread is? Coarse black bread. In Europe, they used to eat. You can still get it here, too. 
It's very coarse, it's very cheap. Coarse black bread with very little food on the table. The rich man, of course, intention here was, you know, I want to deprive myself, I want to be a Nazir, a Tzaddik, whatever his intention was. I don't think, that if I recall the story, I don't think he was because he was a stingy man. He was just trying to be very, you know, modest in his, in his eating. And the rabbi says, you're making a big mistake. Today, you have to eat goose. And tomorrow, turkey. And the following day, steak. He says, why? You see, if you eat goose, turkey, and steak, maybe when the poor man comes to the door, you'll give him a herring. <laughs> but if you eat coarse black bread, what are you going to give to the poor man? If a person has it good and is comfortable and is enjoying, yeah, hopefully he'll share something with the poor. He'll understand that the poor man needs to eat too. But if he deprives himself and limits himself <laughs> to just black bread, he's not going to have any pity on that. Yeah, so that's the point. In other words, you don't exaggerate, but live a comfortable life according to your means. Okay. So now that we understand the value of Asameh Pechelko, that this, the true contentment means the feeling that whatever Hashem gave me, that's what He wants me to have, and, and I should be happy with it. How can we convince that to a poor man? He's poor, he barely has anything, and we tell him, you know what? Be happy with what you have. See, if somebody's middle class, okay. You know, so he has two-bedroom apartment, you know, he doesn't have four. All right, but Baruch Hashem. But what do you tell a poor man that he barely has anything, you know, to eat, you know, struggling? How do you convince him to be happy with his lot, his very small lot? You know how? One of the best advices is there's always somebody out there who has less than you. That's how. That's one way. Look at the fact that Baruch Hashem, you have this. There are others out there that don't even have what you have. Just go to India or Bangladesh, these places, and you'll see. Therefore, the rabbis tell us, look at the word Ashir, and from the word Ashir, you'll be able to figure out who is Ashir. Ashir has four letters. Ein, Shin, Yud, Resh. Ein stands for Einaim, the eyes. Shin for Shinaim, the teeth, Yud for Yadaim, the hands, and Resh for Raglaim, the feet. Baruch Hashem, you have your eyes, you have your teeth, <laughs> you have your hands and feet. Be happy. Because at the hospital, you'll find people that may be missing one or, or more of those things. They don't have it. So when a person visits a hospital, that's a, a good place to visit sometimes. One can see that he has reason to be happy. Reason to be thankful to Hashem, that He has a lot more than others do. So it's not just about material things, money. It's about a lot of other things that matter even more than money. So these are, these are ways where a person can hopefully f focus better on realizing that Hashem has been kind to him, and that He has everything that He needs to have, everything that Hashem wants him to have at least. That's what He has. Who, there was somebody once who a rabbi met, you know, how are things? Yeah. It could be a little bit better. He says, whoever told you that? If it could be better, Hashem would have given it to you. Hashem, is, Hashem feels that this is what's good for you, the way you have it now. Don't ever say it could be better. How do you know? It could be worse. <laughs> person has to take the, whatever situation he is in and say, this is what Hashem wanted me to have. Right? Then I'm happy. Now, there are, of course, there are exceptions to that. There are things that a person does to himself that is wrong depriving himself of certain things, right? Not wanting to do certain things that he should be doing. You know, well, Hashem wants it to be this way. No, Hashem does not, does not want you to be bitter, does not want you to be unhappy, does not want you to remain single, does not want you to be, to be sad or upset, right? Hashem wants us to make an effort, of course, to find a solution to certain problems that, that there are solutions to. I mean, if there's no solution, there's no solution. 
That's already up to us. You can't say, oh, Hashem wanted it to be like that. No, not necessarily. There are areas in life where we have to make an effort, as I said earlier, to improve our lot, to improve our life, to make shalom. No, it's like this. This is the way I am. This is the way she is, and that's the way. No, no, no. You have to try to improve. You have to try to refine yourself, to learn to get along. No, this is the way I am. Accept me the way I am. No, chas shalom. Even though, yes, it's true that people are what they are, but you can, you can make an effort to make things easier and smoother and learn from the mistakes and learn to be accepting and appreciative and all of these things can make the marriage relationship, for example, a lot easier. Even though people are different. Okay, yeah, they're different, okay. But there are tricks. Use your judgment. Right? You do whatever you can to make it easier. So it shouldn't be so hard. That's up to us. Next, the last one that he had, that is admirable in this Mishnah. Ezu Mechubad, who is a respectable person? Who is an honorable person? Who, which individual deserves honors? Who deserves to be respected? Mechubad, HaMechabedet Abriyot. One who is respectful of others. In other words, if you give respect, you will earn respect. That's the real system uh, of, res of respect in this world. To true respect is earned. It needs to be earned. It's not something automatic. It's not something that we should pursue. Rabbi tell us, one who pursues honors, the honor will run away from him. He will never be honored. True respect is something that we earned. And how do we earn it? By giving it to others. Oh, you're respectful of other human beings. In other words, Pasuk in Shemuel, which is a little bit of a different connotation, but basically it means similar, that those who we give honor will give us honor. Those who we care about, we respect them, we treat them as human beings because they have the Tzalem Elohim, the image of Hashem on them. Obviously, that is not only a midah keneg, a midah from Shemaim, but that, they will re that we will re receive that kavod too. But naturally, human beings appreciate that and will return the favor, will return, will have a similar attitude. That is earned, not just you know, acquired because of a man's position. When a man, because of a man's position, people give him kavod, which may be okay and acceptable because of his status, that is not the real kavod, ultimately. That's external. It's external because it has to do with his position, with his money. Even though he may deserve it, fine. He was supposed to give kavod to the, to the rich people. Hashem gave him more money. That's fine. That's correct, acceptable. But it's still external. It's an external kind of kavod because we are giving the kavod to the status. The true kavod is the kavod that's earned. Very important point, because kavod is, is, is one of those yetzarim that people have. Some people like uh, money, other people like women, uh, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a prohibited way, that is. <laughs> and other people like kavod. Kavod, it's so important that they get easily offended and insulted if you didn't, if you didn't give them some position of honor at the chuppah, underneath the chuppah. They feel, oh, why didn't you give me a blessing to make? Oh, you left me out, that means you don't think of me. Not necessarily, it's very difficult. You know, there's only a, not, a limited number of, of berachot to give, and you want to give to family members, right? So some people get very, very offended by this shtuyot, nonsense. These are people who, who the kavod eats away at them. And we already learned this several times, they ruin his life. He's, he feels this, this terrible distress, his aggravation. From not, from not receiving that which you care so much about. But sir, the real kavod is what you earn. And that which you earn, well, of course, will come about as a result of people sincerely, sincerely, sincerely caring about you, sincerely appreciating you, knowing your true value. Anyway, there's a pasuk, a very nice pasuk, 
in Mishle, that ends ve'ish kefima halalo. People are praised according to what they truly are. In other words, ultimately in the end, people, the people who praise you, that will be the indicator of how much praise is is to be given to that individual. The ish kefima halalo. Everyone is what they are. Based on what? How do we know him? Based on what people have to say about it. Because that ultimately is a true indicator because it's based on the Shem Tov of the person, on the good name, not on status. In the end, whatever people have to say about him, that's what he really is. After, after he's passed? No, while he's alive. While he's alive even. After he passed too, but especially while he's alive. I think, there's, I, think I, I should tell you, I may have told you in the past, but it pays to, to say it over again. A story that happened in Bnei Brak about 30 years ago, maybe, maybe less, 27 years ago. I, I don't recall exactly. Very unusual story of a woman who was not religious at all, was walking down the street and she was run over by a bus. And she got killed. Well, unfortunately these things happen. So this is Bnei Brak, a religious town. Onlookers, curious people, immediately gathered and trying to see who this lady is. No identification on no ID on her. Anyway, the police came immediately and they wanted to take the body to the to where they do autopsies. That's their procedure. But the Hebra Kadisha came and said, No way in the world. She's Jewish, we won't allow you to, you know, just stop to do an autopsy for no reason. So there was a big commotion there. Because of the big commotion, more people came to see what's going on. More people came, and guess what happened after that? A big levaya, a big funeral, was formed. Because they basically, the Hebrew Kadisha won. The police relented, you know, they let go, and said, go ahead and make the tara. And this woman, who's an unknown woman, who's not religious, a secular woman, not from Bnei Brak, all of a sudden got this great kavod. It's a big kavod. And that's Mishamayim. Big kavod, that in her funeral, a lot of people attended. Why? Nobody knew. So there was one individual who decided to investigate. He said, I have to, I have to come to the bottom. We know that everything's been Mishamayim. Why did this woman deserve so much kavod? So guess what he found out? She was a Russian immigrant. Not religious. But in Russia, when she was still in Russia, she had one mitzvah that she very much kept. She helped to bury the dead. There was once or more than once a case where a Jew was buried by mistake in the non-Jewish cemetery. She went by herself and dug him up and transferred him to the Jewish cemetery. People who had no burial, people who laid in the street sometimes, she took care of herself and buried them. When he found out this, he says, now I understand. Look what Hashem paid her back. She, she's <coughs> taking care of so many, the dead, she showed so much kavod to them, Hashem repaid that and had everybody show her kavod for what she did. Sure, everything is Hashemai, mitak keneg midah, measure for measure. She gave kavod, she got kavod in return. <coughs> it's also important when people, when we talk about praise and, and giving kavod to someone, it's important to know who the individual praises. Look at a kid's room, you'll see pictures of basketball players. Some kids, you'll see pictures of Chachamim. Who does he look up to? Who does he admire? That's what he is. So it's not only the importance of giving kavod to people, it's important to know who that individual gives kavod to. Who does he look up to? Who does he praise? That's also indicative of who he is. All right, let's see one more Mishnah. Actually, before we go to the Mishnah, an important pasuk to keep in mind, a very famous pasuk that we read in the Aftarah from time to time, Yemiyahu says, Ali Thalel Chacham Bechokmato Gibur Gibor Begvurato Ashir Beoshro Kim Beaskel Viado Aoti. These are more or less the, the words that he says. A Chacham should never be proud of himself because of his Chokhmah. 
a gibor, a strong man should not be so proud of himself because of his strength, or a rich man because of his wealth. What can a person be proud of himself? What should he be happy with? And what is really something to look up to and admirable? Haskel v'yado alti, whoever knows God, whoever is a true servant of Hashem. That is someone to look up to. That's something that the person can be happy about. All these other things of Chochmah, Gvura, and Osher, they came about through Mazal, or inheritance, which is more or less the same thing. <coughs> One did not really do anything unusual on his own to get those three. He was born with that inclination. He was born with that Mazal. He was born with you know, the certain abilities. He has an IQ of 275. So what big deal? He was born with that. You can't develop that. He was born like a gibor, even though, of course, you have to do exercise. Okay. He was born with a mazal to be an ashir. It was not his PhD. It was none of the, the, even though he made efforts and, of course, he built and he bought and this. No, it's ultimately the mazal that got him where he is. All these things are not to be admired because these are things that come through mazal. They're not things that one did on his own. What does one do on his own, on his own from his own free will that is admirable? Is Yerat Shammayim. God, how much does he fear God? How much of a good Jew he is? How much does he help others? How many mitzvot he does? These are things to look up to because that he does on his own, from his own volition. That he does on his own. Not his mazal. Nobody tells him to do it. He did those things on his own. Smart, intelligence. He knows the whole yellow pages by heart. You know, there's, there are people like that. All kinds of weird records. Big deal. There's nothing to admire here. It's nice. It's cute. It's interesting but not admirable, because he didn't do it on his own. Some effort, maybe, yes, but it's really a gift from Shemaim. That's all it is. Shem has all kinds of gifts that he distributes in this world. Money here, chokhmah here, gvura there. No. Haskel v'yadot, he says, what's, what's really admirable is somebody that knows me, somebody that thinks about me, somebody that is devoted to me. Next, Mishnah, Ben Azai Omer, Haveras le Mitzvah Kala, one should run to a, a small mitzvah as though this is a big mitzvah, even though usually we don't know, obviously, what is a big mitzvah and what is a small mitzvah, at least in our mind, even though this may appear to be a small mitzvah compared to another bigger mitzvah, we should always pursue it, we should always try to fulfill it and not leave it alone, not say, I'll come back to it when I can another time. And run away from sin, any sin. Why? So maybe if we'll, we'll first read the Mishnah, then we'll come back to it. The reason for that is because she mitzvah goreret mitzvah, one mitzvah leads to another mitzvah, and avera goreret avera, and one avera leads to another avera. So you want to do mitzvot, even though they're small, because they will lead you to do more mitzvot. You want to run away from averot, because one avera can lead one to do another avera. Besides that, Sheschar mitzvah, mitzvah, sheschar avera, avera. Even though it's not something, it's not a really another point, it's really the same, but it's also another point that the reward of a mitzvah is an additional mitzvah, and the reward of an avera, even though it's not a real reward, is you get to do another avera. In other words, a person ends up chazm shalom doing more. So what's going on over here? Ben Azai wants to impress upon us the importance of opportunity, opportunities that arise to take proper advantage of, not to let them go, especially when these are opportunities to perform its vot. There's a nice minhag I heard in Morocco, there used to be in Morocco, minhag and custom, that people made a great effort to go to a house of mourning. A mourner? Why? Because a wedding, you can always tell your friend, I'm sorry I couldn't make it. I'll see you at the next wedding in the family. Could you imagine telling the guy, I'm sorry I didn't come to comfort you. I'll see you next time. <laughs> no, you don't want to say that. So the people always made an effort to go to a house of mourning. <laughs> so they shouldn't have to say it next time. Around. But anyway, Ben Azai impresses upon us the importance of mitzvah kala. What's so significant about a mitzvah kala? It's not so much the mitzvah, per se, even though every mitzvah counts, every mitzvah goes on our record. It's also initiative and momentum. 
That's what we're dealing with here. We're talking about initiative and momentum. Take advantage of every mitzvah that comes your way because you want to always be on the initiative to do mitzvot, not to procrastinate, not, to cut, not when you feel like it. When it comes to mitzvot, it's always better to be the one who initiates. Why? Because that will lead to a momentum. Momentum means that you're, you're doing it and you continue to do it. You stop, it becomes harder the next time. So take the initiative and therefore don't miss the opportunity, even for small mitzvot that come your way. Don't wait for them to come your way. You go ahead and do it. Real, the real tzedakah is not when a poor man comes to you and asks you, you get up and start looking for him. Where is there somebody that I can help? That's a much higher level of mitzvah than having him come to you and going through the embarrassment. You search him. That initiative is, is very powerful because it gives momentum. So therefore, even a small mitzvah can ignite it. That's the idea over here. Besides that, if a person runs to do a mitzvah, what does it show? It shows that he loves the mitzvot. How do you know if a person loves the mitzvot? Well, in the same way, how do you know if the food is tasty? When a guy asks for doubles, I want more. Do you ask some more? Oh, that means you liked it. That means it's good, huh? So when a Jew looks for more mitzvot, looks for an opportunity, it shows that he, he likes them. He cares about them. So it, it shows something about the individual. So anyway... This initiative leads to momentum. Every mitzvah gives the individual more strength. How does it give him more strength? Mitzvah goreret mitzvah. It leads one to do more mitzvot. And the reason for that is because of two things. One is because he get the momentum brings about a certain continuity of habit of doing it. Out of, you know, not not he's doing it out of habit, but he's into he's into doing it on a regular basis. So it becomes habitual. Plus, also, he receives Ezra min because when they see that he wants it, they send him one. That is the meaning of schar mitzvah mitzvah. There's a schar here too. Not only momentum, but not only strength and habit, but also schar mitzvah mitzvah. They help him in Shemaim too. Oh, you've proven yourself that you know what to do with a million bucks. We're going to give you another million dollars. You, show, you, you showed us that you know what to do, to do the right things with it. Somebody doesn't, they, take, they may take it away from him. You don't know what to do with it. You're going just to Vegas. Right? But if you demonstrate that you want to, then Hashem helps too. So that's two things here. Momentum plus schar mitzvah mitzvah. What about Averot? Averot just the opposite. Chaz Shalom. If a person does an Averot once, he should feel bad, the rabbis tell us. Because now, a petach niftachlo, the door is wide open. The next time, it might be easier for him to do it. The first time, he was hesitating. But he made a mistake. Feel bad about it. Regret it. Repent about it. Why? Because if you don't, that avera has such strength that it may draw you like quicksand, chas shalom, into another one. So therefore, we have to feel bad not about the avera as much as about the door has been opened. The door now is open, and the next time it could be easier, chas shalom. That's what we have to feel bad about. As the rabbis tell us, after one laset lo keheter, it becomes permissible. So that's the meaning of avera goreret avera plus schar avera avera, because it becomes permissible. No. So it's like he's being rewarded with another one. Because next time he's going to look at it, it's okay, it's not the end of the world. That's why you have, we have to break the habit, we have to break, we have to stop the avera on its track before it continues on and becomes like a, a bigger snowball, right? As it, as, it rolls, as it rolls down the mountain. We have to stop it in its tracks, repent for it, ask forgiveness for it, go to the mikveh for it, depending on the avera. And this way we're able to stop it. As the rabbis tell us, if a person really regrets it right after he did it, that regret not only removes the accusation from him, it also helps him deal with the yetzerah in the future because that yetzer doesn't have any more momentum to continue. So anyway, the importance of this mitzvah, just to finish up over here, is to, is to put emphasis on how one needs to demonstrate how much he loves mitzvot and how serious he is about Avera. He has to demonstrate that 
by with mitzvot by taking the initiative with mitzvot and with averot by being extra cautious and staying away from even an averak tana. How does one in the end really demonstrate that he loves Hashem? A lot of people say we love Hashem, we love Hashem. Really in three ways. There's three ways you can show that you love Hashem. Number one, do you love the avodat of Hashem, the mitzvot, in the same way you love other things? You love, you love to drive, you love to go on vacation, we love to do things. Is that love the same with the mitzvot? Do you feel the same when we do a mitzvah as, as we do other things? If you say, yes, I feel as excited about this mitzvah as I do about other things, that's a good sign. That's number one. Number two, how many hours do we devote to mitzvot? Do we devote as much or close to as much as we devote to other things that are trivial, especially trivial, even though it's not well, work is work. Trivial. Other people, some people spend time, a lot of time on newspapers, on the internet, on junk stuff, uh, sports section, gossip section. You could have said Tehillim. You could have read the, uh, some, some Dvar Torah when you were on, in, in a taxi, you were in the subway, you had nothing to do. I mean, come on. So it, that's an indicator, an indicator too, how much time do we spend on that? And number three, when we do mitzvot, are we excited to do it? Or are we doing it, oh, I gotta get this over with. That also, all of these are indicators of how much a person really likes the mitzvot. And finally, last but not least, in the end, Ben Azai is, is reminding us, have a You have to run towards the mitzvot, which means you have to look for opportunities Mitzvah, even though certain mitzvot only come our way whenever they come. That's true. They present themselves. But if you really, really care about it, you really want to have that momentum, as we said earlier, you always want to be doing the right thing. Be in the habit of being rats. You know, always looking for opportunities to help, looking for opportunities to do certain mitzvot, and not for the mitzvot to come his way. Rats shows that you, you want more. Rats, as we said before, it, it builds up momentum, and it therefore it will, will also be a venue for more mitzvot because Hashem says, okay, this man really is eager to do more. So I'm going to send him. And th in this way, his mitzvot will build up. All his reward in Olam Abba as well. Not only in Olam Azeh, there are good fruits, perot, that one gets from the consequence of doing a mitzvah. But also he builds up his mitzvot, his record for Olam Abba, where others would not. Because they just did what they have to do. Some people just do what they have to do. That's the Chovah. This man wants more. Wants more, they will send him more. With Avera, with Avera, it's just the opposite. That one has to be extremely careful to stay away from any risky situation. And that is, that is another point that was very, very much emphasized is, is Boreach, run away. It doesn't it say just stay away, run away. Which means, you know, a person should never say, oh, it's okay, it won't happen to me, I'll be fine. Shlomo Melech said that and he made a big mistake. Right? A lot of people fell because they were overconfident in themselves. Averot, you see something that may, something bad can come out of it? Boreach, like from fire, run away from it. Because falling there will make it worse later. As it is, this is bad enough, but imagine what will happen later. So one has to look at these things in, with the right perspective. What is a mitzvah? It's not just a good deed. I'm commanded by Hashem to do it. It's not just my boss. It's the Creator who gave me this opportunity, and He will help me. This is, a, this is a proper way of looking at it. Therefore, I'm going to run. I'm going to show that I care, even though it's difficult to wake up in the morning or to go to a shiur. I want to demonstrate that, that this is real. So we have to get into that habit of being rats to mitzvot. And obviously, when it comes to sinful situations, risky situations, and there are many risky situations outside, stay away from it from fire, which is, of course, a very important point that people don't understand. It's fire. It's risky. Don't take a chance. Sometimes it's not worth it because it's, it, it lures you. It's a, it could be a trap. And it could lead to other things and worse things. So the Chachamim tell us, stay away a big distance from certain things. Because the smile, and the, what are you doing for lunch today? And this, and all kinds of things that can lure you. And there are certain areas of Averot that are big traps. Big traps, and that is of course the area of Tzni'ut, of being of course modest distance between men and women. That is where we have Mechitzot. And we have a tremendous amount of Shemira, protection from not talking too much, and not, for sure not flirting, and not, for sure not dancing, unless it's your wife, of course, dance all night you. <laughs> but 
Things that are forbidden, stay away from it. Because if we get too close, it requires tremendous, much more power to overcome the Yetzir. Why put yourself in, the, in that place to begin with? Leave the bear outside. Don't open the door. You open him the door, he comes in. You're going to fight the bear when he's inside? When the door is closed, you have a better chance. He won't break down the door, hopefully. <laughs> but you let him in. People are letting the Yetzir in by watching TV, by watching the, certain things in the Internet, by certain magazines. They're bringing him in. That becomes very risky. How are you going to fight him now? when all of the mind is being contaminated by what is being seen. Don't see it. Don't look at it. And this way, without Hashem, you'll be protected. Thank you.